Welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, my name is Miguel Castro Coelho. I'm a, a fellow here at the Institute. And uh, thank you for coming to this seminar on the politics of uh, regulation. This is the last in a series of uh, seminars and private roundtables that we've held over the past few months uh, on uh, government and regulators. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the City of London Corporation uh, for their kind support to this uh, series. And I just wanted to say before I hand over to uh, Anna Walker, who is going to be chairing the session, that we do not have any uh, fire alarm tests planned today. So if, if you do hear the fire alarm, please make your way out through the main staircase and the main door. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Anna Walker. Well, um, thank you. Uh, Thank you everybody for coming. I'm extremely conscious that this has been so popular that there are people uh, outside. And when the, uh, we get to the questions, if there are questions from people out there, I shall want to make sure that they come into the room and can then feel part of the discussion as well. Um, the idea of today is to explore the relationship between politics and regulation. Um, and particularly, if it's the case, what the problems, if they are problems, are now, looking to the future. So how should regulation evolve to deal with those <coughs> issues? We've got three very distinguished <coughs> speakers. I, I'm, I'm going to hand over to them just as fast as possible. I'm going to ask each to speak for no longer than seven to ten minutes, if I may. Um, and uh, I'll uh, introduce them actually uh, as, uh, as you speak. Tom, I suggest that uh, I, we start with you. Uh, Sir Tom Windsor, uh, who is the uh, Chief Inspector for uh, the Her Majesty's Constabulary, and was actually uh, one of my predecessors at the Office of, of what was then regulation, rail regulation. That's right. Uh, do you want me to stay here or go up there? I don't Whichever mind. you prefer. Yeah, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'll go up there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, for the courtesy of your attention. Um, I have been asked to consider the interplay between politics and regulation. And I understand this is an on-the-record event and journalists may be present, so my press office told me that I shouldn't say everything I plan to say. Um, <laughs> I'll do this uh, in the... Well, I probably will. Um, I'll do this in the context of independence of regulation. I think that's the most important thing. Um, let's have a brief reminder first, why are economic regulators independent, and other institutions, but economic regulators independent so that political criteria do not intrude into decisions which need to be based on economic engineering and other non-political criteria. Political horizons are far too short for some of the decisions that need to be taken even though they are in the public interest. Not everything goes uh, well with politicians. Independence comes from, usually, the absence of political criteria in the regulator's statutory remit and statutory duties. It comes from the absence of a power of direction in the hands of ministers or other political institutions to tell the regulatory authority what to do or not to do. The absence of a right of appeal to the minister if you don't like the regulator's decision. And the absence of the power of the minister to dismiss the regulator on grounds other than the narrowest ones, which are pretty much the same as high court judges, namely incapacity or misbehavior. Disagreeing with the minister does not count. Now, the, the papers that we were given at the beginning talks about the blurred boundaries between elected politicians and independent institutions. And yes, they can be blurred, but sometimes they can be so fragile and so brittle that they will fracture if they are put under undue pressure. And that's what sometimes happens. But let us also bear in mind that when the industries in question were in public hands, when they were nationalized industries, ministers had far fewer specific powers over those industries than the newly created economic regulators were to have when the industries were reorganized for privatization and then eventually put into the private sector. And there is sometimes detected a jealousy, a boiling jealousy of civil servants in central government departments 
when they look at the powers the regulators have. And that is an important dynamic. And that gets intensified when the regulatory authorities don't tell the central government departments in question what they're planning to do, why they're going to do it, and when they're going to do it, or whether they're not going to do it. And that kind of communication, which I think is highly desirable, that there should be two-way communication between the host government department and the regulatory authority, but it can only really take place if there's a relationship of trust. And the Department for Transport in my time made it abundantly clear that I could not trust them. There is a, and again this is not widespread, but these are my observations from my experience as a regulator. I can talk in the question session about what it's like with the police, and I have to say the police are completely different from the railways um, in all sorts of ways that we could discuss. But there is sometimes in the hands of politicians a refusal, deliberate or otherwise, to understand why the institutions in question are independent or a refusal to respect that independence. I'm elected, you're not. So what I say has to go. I'll come back to that. Now independence has two elements, legal and behavioural, and you need both. Your legal independence comes from your statutory remit. It is what it is. Parliament could change the law and take away that independence, but until it does, it's there. And then there's behavioural independence. And I remember writing to my immediate successors, and Anna was not one of my immediate successors. I was the last single person regulator for the railways. When I left, they changed it into a board of 12 people with a non-executive chair and a full-time chief executive, and it was good to know that all these years I've been doing the work of 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I wrote a letter to my successors, and I said this. It is extremely important that when you are faced with a decision which the industry and others know you would take in one way and you take it in a different way because it is clear you are doing it according to political, in other words improper, legally irrelevant criteria. When you show through your behaviour that you are not really independent, irrespective of your legal remit, your independence will have gone and you will never get it back. It took my immediate successor six months to do exactly what I warned them not to do. There is a political intolerance and impatience with industries that are performing badly, principally with the performance of the industries or the companies under the jurisdiction of the regulators. So when things are going wrong, things get much hotter. So the best thing for a regulator to do is, a, is to do a conspicuously good job be ahead of the companies in question, know what's going on, see what's going wrong before it goes wrong, and then take a prompt and appropriate action to do everything within your power <coughs> to prevent it happening. Sometimes that'll be impossible, most of the time it is possible. But events sometimes overwhelm. The Hatfield rail crash took place on the 17th of October 2000. Four men died, 56 people were injured, some of them seriously and the railway network went into meltdown. Rail track threw on 1,200 emergency speed restrictions all over the network, mainly because they did not know where else a rail might break under a train going at high speed somewhere on their network. So there was, it was a catastrophic breakdown in the operational integrity of the network. And what happened? The politicians got really, really upset about that. Now, why didn't we, the regulatory authority, know that that might happen. Because pretty much to the day when the Hatfield train crash took place, I had made my final decision in the first periodic review, I must be the only regulator to do two quinquennial reviews in the space of four years. I had made my final decision to increase the financial settlement of Railtrack from 10 to 14.8 billion pounds. But that had to be on the basis of the information that we had at the time about the condition, capacity, capability, serviceability, performance of the network. And when I got into office, I was staggered at how little the regulatory authority really knew about those things. And why was that, I asked my new colleagues, and that's because Railtrack don't have the information themselves. What are you doing to ensure that you can get that information, answer, 
don't know, what, have you got any ideas, Tom? Well, we, we immediately amended their network license to require them to produce an asset register and lots of other things, but that takes time. There's 20,000 kilometers of railway network. There are 90,000 bridges over the network, etc., etc. You can't produce one of these overnight. So I was pretty appalled about that, but we had to make the decision on the basis of the information we had. And guess what? It wasn't enough money because the condition of the network was worse and therefore they needed more money. Well, that was far too slow for the politicians. And their political impatience with the performance of the railway boiled over, intensified by a visceral hatred of the Tory privatization of the railways and rail track in particular. So they saw their chance. So they devised, in the Treasury principally, Stephen Byers, anybody remember him? <laughs> Stephen Byers was the Secretary of State for Transport at the time, and he was, in my opinion, the instrument of the Treasury. This was not his plan. This was far too, good. This was far too sophisticated. <laughs> so there was a Treasury plan uh, to take back the track, the old union slogan, time to take back the track. And they came up with a cunning plan, wasn't that cunning, cunning plan, to achieve renationalization of the railway network without paying any money for it at all. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. They end up paying pretty close to the pre-closing share price of Railtrack after they carried out what was effectively a political assassination of a FTSE 100 company. Now, you may not mourn the victim, but you can mourn the manner of his passing. And Railtrack, for all its faults, did not deserve to be put to death in that way. The plan was illegal. Lies were told to a high court judge in order to secure the plan. And it initially, it appeared to work. They put the company into railway administration because they told the company it was, in, they told the judge it was insolvent. It wasn't insolvent. But they withheld, or rather one particular individual, withheld information from the court in order to secure the result in question. Well, I think that was just dreadful. And if anybody wants to see more of that, read Hansard for the 24th of October 2005, um, the debate on the collapse of rail track for some of the detail. <coughs> but people talk about the legitimacy of regulators. So th the story I've just very briefly told is about the collapse of rail track and the Im political impatience with the company. And the one thing that could stop the cunning plan working was the power of the independent regulator to restore the solvency of rail track, assuming it was insolvent, which it wasn't. And so I was called into Stephen Byer's office <clears throat> on a Friday afternoon after the stock market finished and was told that uh, the company was insolvent. They'd done a lot of work over the summer and they were going to court on Sunday afternoon to put the company into administration. And the only criterion for going into administration was the company was insolvent. So I was a bit stunned by that, and I said to Mr. Byers, um, well, I'm its economic regulator. I've just increased its revenues by 4.8 billion pounds. And uh, if the company was on the precipice of insolvency, I would know about that. Well, what they tell you is different, but we are satisfied. So I said, well, the, does the chairman of Railtrack know this? No, he's coming in after you, and we're going to tell him then. So I said, well, if I were the chairman of Railtrack hearing this news, I would immediately apply to the rail regulator to advance the interim review of my financial affairs because the Hatfield crash, we'd have to promise a reopener. I would ask him to advance the, the financial review so as to restore my solvency. Yeah, we thought of that, said Byers. And if they apply to you over the weekend for the acceleration of that financial review, he said, I have the authority of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to introduce emergency legislation into Parliament to take you, the regulator, under direct political control. <laughs> and after pausing to consider whether I'd really heard what I'd heard, I asked if that would be in relation to all my powers or just, just the power to do the financial review. He said it would be in relation to everything, competition law, everything but its first use would be to prevent the review proceeding. I then gave him a long list of reasons why that would be a really bad idea, including the independence of all the other regulators as well as private investment in the railway industry, the independence of the Bank of England, the government's reputation for respecting the sanctity of contract, everything, but they weren't listening. They decided to do it, and so they did it. Railtrack did not oppose the application 
for the administration order, and they went quietly into that long, dark night. The date chosen for the, uh, for the action just, purest coincidence, happened to be the day on which the RAF and the US Air Force began bombing in Af Afghanistan. Purest coincidence. But it was still on the front pages of the papers for a long time afterwards. So that's political impatience and a willingness to take violent political action against an independent regulator if he had the temerity to stand up to their plans. So the next day, Railtrack called me up and said, listen, if we came to you tonight, would you do the review? And I said, yeah, of course I will. But I need to know how much money do you need um, and what are the grounds of the review? How much money do you need and, and, when, and when do you need it? And they said, well, the grounds of the review are the yawning gap between what you just gave us and what we really need and the burgeoning cost of the West Coast Main Line, which had gone from 2.2 to 13.8 billion pounds, which is not a small overrun. How much money do you need? Hundreds of millions of pounds, said the chairman. Turned out to be 7.4 billion. When do you need the money Monday? Well, come on. So I said, look, I can give you, a, I can give you a, a letter. You can show it to the judge tomorrow and saying I've started the review and he will not make their administration order. They didn't want the letter. They just went quietly. Well, there was a hell of a political row as a result of that. The administration of Railtrack lasted for four times as long as they projected. And in order to get the company out of administration, they had to go back to the High Court and say, this company is solvent. And what is the grounds of saying that it's solvent? And they said, well, there's an independent regulator and he's going to do a financial review. <laughs> exactly the same powers that they threatened me with legislation to extinguish if I had the temerity to start the review, which I was willing to do, but Railtrack wouldn't take it. Well, that's that story. Now, people rail against unelected institutions. I mentioned at the beginning, you're not elected and I am. See, I did do the review that I promised Railtrack and we, we increased the financial settlement from 14.8 to 22.2 billion pounds. That's an extra 7.4 billion. It's a lot of money. And I remember Alistair Darling, who was by then Secretary of State for Transport because buyers didn't survive, and he got really cross with me. Now, getting any emotion out of Alistair Darling is a major achievement, but anger was the one I got. <laughs> and I'm sure he's a very emotional man. Uh, he was very cross. And the, and the tenor of the conversation was, I'm elected and you're not. Well, when Parliament takes away my jurisdiction, that's fine for Parliament to do. But my powers come from the authority of Parliament, not from the whim of a minister. But I don't think that that really bites with some people. And sometimes there's an argument about unelected judges. How many of times have you heard the newspapers say, oh, these unelected judges, how dare they be making up the law and thwarting the will of Parliament and all the rest of it. Completely, utterly illiterate, as you will gather. But they, they rail against them. And they hold up, actually, the European Court of Human Rights as an example, blissfully ignoring the fact that these are the only judges with jurisdiction in this country who are elected. But why <laughs> let the facts get in the way? So, the possession of very considerable power intensifies the risk that politicians will intrude, particularly when things go wrong, or they think you're going to make a decision that they really don't like. And they, there's also a risk that the nature and the source and the purposes of the power of the independent regulator will be misrepresented. And that is an ex extremely dangerous thing as well. I was at a conference, I'm going to come to an end now because I'm almost out of time. Um, more than out of time, I'm so sorry. Um, We're enjoying it though. <laughs> I'll, I'll, the, the, I was at a conference sometime later and the, the, one of the other economic regulators said at a, at a public, conference, pu pu public conference, he said, look, you know, I'm not elected, the minister is. I know that my statutory duties do not include pri political criteria, but Because he's elected, he has a higher democratic legitimacy than I do. Therefore, if I believe that my statutory duties point in one direction, but the, pol the, the minister wants me to do something else, I will defer to the minister because he's elected. And I said to him, come on, your power comes from the highest source of democratic legitimacy, namely parliament. There's nowhere higher. After all, I added, we live in a system under the rule of law. And he said, I regard the rule of law as a scary concept. With regulators like that, you don't really need to worry about legal independence and so on. 
When you've got regulators with the DNA of deference, the genetic matrix of obedience, it's heaven for the ministers. So the moral of the story finally is independent economic regulation requires really good nerves. You need to be true to yourself and to your strategy remit. Discard any hopes of being reappointed. It might happen, but don't, don't count on it. And certainly don't change your behavior in order to do it. Or other favors of patronage. Good communication between you and the host government department and a relationship of trust with politicians is highly desirable, but it really does take two to tango. And the more important is the relationship with the public. Because when the public trusts you, it is much harder for the politicians to um, dis destabilize you and assault you. Now, that may have some... It may very well be that the regulator could even become more trusted by the public than the politician. That may have some validity in the short term. And that includes making really big decisions, knowing that they can't be undone, but that they won't be able to be repeated. Voltaire said it right when he said, it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. So be prepared, <laughs> regulators. Get your reforms dug well in with reinforced concrete and blast-proof covers as early as possible in your term of office so that they cannot be reversed by your successors who may be more politically deferential or just plain neglectful. And for reforming regulators, it's also opposite to bear in mind that revolutions often devour their own children. In more modern times, I prefer the words of the Northampton Mercury in its obituary of Sir Robert Peel, the father of modern policing, when he said, there are some victories which are necessarily fatal to the conqueror. So bear that in mind. In my own case, the repose of my regulatory soul lasted only eight years. And my Lazarine resurrection required a change of government, of course. Labour government wouldn't have appointed me to be a school crossing patrolman after what I did. <laughs> the shadow cabinet minister who ferociously defended my independence and defended my defence of my independence in Parliament at the time of that shocking uh, business of the collapse of rail track became Home Secretary in 2010. So the sun can rise in the West. Sometimes. <laughs> I apologize for going too long. Well, that's got uh, the uh, discussion going in a really good way, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, I'll and I'll and uh, moving on now, if we may, to uh, the Right Honourable Sir Edward Davy, who was the uh, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in the coalition government. And actually, I came across, Ed, when you were looking at uh, competition and consumer issues uh, when you were a minister at uh, Biz. And so you, you have a long record of looking both at the consumer side and at politicians versus regulators. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm going to say sort of something quite similar to Tom, but in a much less amusing and enjoyable uh, way. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I want to defend uh, independent regulators um, as a politician um, and I want to explain why that's so important because I think they are under attack uh, and I think they're under attack today. Uh, they may be under attack under the Labour government but I see two populist trends in British politics. One is which is saying that elected politicians, although they're scoundrels, should be accountable for everything and they're asked to be accountable for everything in the media and by the public. And a second trend that says regulators and regulations are ipso facto bad because they're interventions in otherwise perfect markets. And they are odd trends to, to have together, but they are there. And I think uh, they are undermining the case for independent regulation that we've heard so eloquently. And I want to, in defending the case, give a few examples from my five years in government uh, to illustrate four of the classic arguments for independent regulation. Namely, first how independent regulation can be a shield from the dangers of political lobbying and short-term political pressure. Not always, as we heard, but it can be. How independent regulators doing the job well can actually raise investment uh, by increasing uncertainty and therefore reduce costs to the consumers. How independent regulators can produce better outcomes by bringing together greater expertise and focus 
than would be available uh, in a department and other ministers. And fourthly, how independent regulators can help improve public confidence and industry confidence, especially around controversial and difficult decisions. And my experience uh, comes, uh, as Anna was saying, not just from the energy space, where I worked very closely with Ofgem and the Office of Nuclear Regulation, but I also was responsible for merging the OFT with the Competition Commission. When I was Minister for Competition, uh, I transferred po POSCOM's responsibilities uh, to Ofcom, in fact to Ed, uh, when he was Chief Executive, uh, as I piloted the Royal Mail privatisation through Parliament. And finally, uh, I created a new regulator, the Oil and Gas Authority, which was taking regulatory powers out of ministerial hands into a new arm's length regulator. So uh, through these arguments at a canter, first, energy prices, hugely controversial, still so, but uh, possibly more so a few years ago. Uh, and I think Ofgem and the CMA saved us from a return to full-scale price regulation. Um, and it's quite a fascinating story because it starts with an energy secretary who in office had always refused to intervene in the price debate and he then becomes the leader of the opposition. Uh, he's in political trouble and he reads the opinion polls which told him, like it was telling me, that energy prices were a rising concern uh, and uh, if he did something about it, he might gain some popularity. So he had a party, party conference speech to make and the centrepiece just became a call for an energy price freeze. Now this was very effective politics, got some great headlines. The coalition went into a total frenzy. Well, number 10 and number 11 did. Uh, the PM thought he was politically vulnerable. The Chancellor saw it as a, as a chance to attack green crap, uh, even though the green levies were empirically not the problem. And then we had three months of intense internal debate in the government, with one infamous moment that I'd like to remind you of. The moment when a Conservative Prime Minister from the dispatch box said there should be one price for energy. One price. Conservative. Unless you think that was a slip of the tongue at the dispatch box, Number 10's Downing Street's minions had been pressurising my office for days to consider that proposition. Ofgem came to the rescue. Perhaps more by fortune than planning, Ofgem was the next week due to release the conclusions of a two-year-long uh, retail market review. Now that recommended energy suppliers could only offer four core tariffs around which they could compete. Now as it happened, I thought four core tariffs were too few. I got off Jim's uh, argument that intervention was needed to prevent the proliferation <coughs> of tariffs confusing the consumer and thereby undermining competition. I just thought they'd gone too far. Number 10 didn't. And as they thrashed around to dig the Prime Minister out of the hole, they first wanted to use the Ofgem report to argue for two tariffs, then for three. So I compromised and I accepted Ofgem's recommendation of four tariffs. <laughs> Independent regulation is a fabulous cushion when the immediate political debate goes to the mob and our political leaders are weak. Independent regulation in the economic sphere is, of course, key for increasing investment and keeping costs down. I don't need to remind you that many investments in the utility space are long-term, needing high levels of capital up front. So for the private sector, the private investor, predictability of regulation is prized very, very highly and can make a huge difference in an investment risk profile, therefore the project cost, and therefore the price to the consumer. And for an energy and climate change secretary, this ought to be paramount. When I came to office in 2012, the UK needed tens of billions of new investment in our energy infrastructure over the following 10 to 15 years. Now, we were on track uh, last May, but that still leaved, uh, leaves a mountain to climb. But independent regulation is important here, even though there's lots of things changing in the system inevitably. And let me give you one clear example where we are benefiting from Ofgem's independent regulatory system. And that's how they regulate the electricity and gas networks, the local and national monopolies of distribution and transmission, the so-called RIO system, revenue equals incentives plus innovation plus outputs. This Ofgem model, introduced before my time, is leading to billions being invested, attracting investment from around the world, with the network cost paid for by consumers on a long-term decline. Governments from around the world have been visiting the UK to find out how we've done it, 
Yet in the UK, it's one of our best kept secrets, and Ofgem doesn't talk about it. I think they should. Now, of course, there are a plethora of examples that I could have used in that, this area of investment, including ones where regulatory uncertainty has damaged investments, been a blight on investment. I would, of course, like to talk about examples where new governments, unencumbered by economic liberals, change energy policy so sharply that investment plummets and energy security is genuinely imperiled. But that's another story. Please invite me back. Um, let me skip on to the expertise benefits of independent regulation. And I want to pray and aid my decisions to wrap Postcom into Ofcom and to merge the OFT with the Competition Commission. But before I do, let me make a little political confession. There was a drive, a political drive in the coalition, to reduce the headcount of quangos. So ministers were encouraged to combine quangos and regulators as quangos. I like to think, however, that I took my decisions based on the evidence, but that will be for you to judge. With POSCOM, my fear was that it was just too small and had been too focused on detailed regulation of a public mono monopoly. I felt that in the new world we were creating of a more aggressive private raw mail, coupled with demanding new competitors, POSCOM had to be reinforced, both by size and by experts more experienced with such battles. Plus, of course, regulating physical communication uh, by letters separately from electronic looked outdated, and the interaction of the digital space with parcels looks compelling. But the key point for the decision, though, was this. At no time did we seriously contemplate any model other than independent regulation for postal services. Ofcom had the expertise, the department didn't. And therefore, I think, uh, obviously, it was the right thing to do. When it comes to the competition authorities, merging OFT and the Competition Commission, I was really quite careful and cautious about this. Um, I probably spent more time working on this with towels around my head than on any other decision I took in government, because there was a strong argument that we'd already had a well-functioning competition regime, and that actually regulatory change here of the system would chill investment uh, and damage the economy. So I only proceeded, despite all the pressures coming from elsewhere, after being convinced that the combination of the reforms that we were making, both to the institutions and to the law, together, would improve the regime. And one of the more compelling arguments was the bringing together of expertise combined with greater powers for the CMA. Especially the powers to enable, this may be controversial in this audience, that greater expertise of the CMA to be used with the various domestic economic regulators, who sometimes, I think, go for the regulatory toolbox more than, uh, quicker than, than going to the competition toolbox. And I wanted to go further in the law, but I was uh, thwarted. Um, but in creating uh, more expertise at CMA, I also wanted it to be used in the international sphere, obviously the EU and beyond, and the Act uh, has that in place. So in this CMA, I believe we've created a global leader in independent competition regulation with enhanced authority, therefore, thereby strengthening its uh, legitimacy and role. And I was actually delighted that its first investigation was into the energy markets, uh, and uh, that, there was a serendipity there. My final point to defend independent regulators relates to their ability to command public and industry confidence in a way which a minister and government department in some circumstances will never be able to do. And my example is the Office of Nuclear Regulation, though a similar argument can be made with respect to industry confidence about the oil and gas authority that I established uh, taking uh, regulatory powers from my department. Now the ONR fortunately is not well known, uh, but it has lots of clever people taking decisions on information ministers and officials wouldn't begin to understand and with experience we could never have. The ANR are taking highly controversial decisions, licensing nuclear reactor designs, agreeing to life extension of aging nuclear reactors mm -hmm. and the like. But I'm not convinced the public want politicians in charge of those decisions. And I'm proud to have legislated to put the ONR on a statutory independent footing, whilst at the same time requiring them to be more publicly accountable and transparent so that their annual reports are published. And we had an interesting discussion about the publication of their first annual report where they weren't very media savvy, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, now, no one reported about these changes uh, to the 
regime of the, of the nuclear uh, regulator. But if there is to be a nuclear power renaissance in Britain, and I think the jury is still out on that, but if there is, then the public, I believe, needed these additional protections and reassurances from an independent, a strategy independent regulator. So let me conclude. I think the case for independent regulators is as strong as ever, and recent evidence and my experience support that. But, and here's an important but, regulators must not become so detached from public opinion that they take their decisions and make their statements as if they have a divine right to exist. This is sort of the mirror of what Tom was saying. I think it's completely consistent with what he said. Because an independent regulator's legitimacy will always be under the public spotlight. And my experience was sometimes not every individual regulator appreciated that enough. Sometimes independent regulators see ministers as the problem, and maybe they were sometimes, but they don't seem to recognise sometimes that ministers don't write newspaper editorials. Ministers, by and large, ought to be the regulator's best friend and vice versa. But partnership working, when, when problems are inherently difficult and complex, is sometimes frowned upon by regulators as undermining true independence. I don't think it need be, though that, of course that may depend on the minister and the government. Sometimes independent regulators feel they have no job advocating for their policy decisions and see the role of their press office and communications team as purely providers of information unsullied by any attempt to explain in words that a journalist on a deadline might understand. That is a profound mistake. Independent, independent regulators need to talk to politicians to find out how best to protect their independence. And this is vital because the anti-regulator brigade is, I fear, zealously on the march in parts of the government and the media. Some of them want to tie their anti-Brussels rhetoric with anti-regulator rhetoric, as they see them both as forces that restrict their ability to do what they want when they want to do it. But as a liberal, I see the case for independent regulation and for our membership of the EU as based on the same philosophical insight that a society is better run when political power is more dispersed, checked, and limited. A world where elected politicians of the moment can have it all their own way and take irrational decisions, not by, based on evidence or the long-term public good, is not a world that I want to live in. So politicians should learn to treasure and nurture independent regulators, however frustrating they can be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And now thirdly, Ed Richards, now managing partner of Flint Global and the independent chair of the Financial Services Trade Association's review, but after a, a, a long and distinguished period as uh, chief executive of Ofcom. And there is no doubt that in the various jobs I have done, Ed, while you were doing that job, I learned a lot from you. That's very kind, Anna. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Um, let, let me, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, make any allegations of lies to high court judges or anything <laughs> of that kind. Uh, uh, the day will come, but today will not be the day for, for the full gory detail of my own experience. Um, uh, I actually want to cover broadly similar territory, so I'm going to sort of edit what I was going to say because some of it's been covered. But first, perhaps, just say the kind of uh, perspective that I take on this. So I used to work once upon a time in Downing Street. Uh, I then went to Ofcom, spent 11 years at Ofcom, around nine years as chief executive. And as Anna said, I've fairly recently set up a company, uh, and we do a lot of work with companies who work or... Uh, 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 interact with regulators and governments. So in a sense, I've seen this from three different perspectives. I've seen it inside politics. I've seen it as a chief executive of a, a, a significant regulator uh, and from the perspective of companies as well. And what I want to do is actually put a little bit of history uh, on this because I think it's very important to see how this debate has changed through time. So when I think about this, I go back to the original conception, the intellectual conception of intellectual uh, of independent regulation, which was the precursor, if you like, to its first manifestation in the UK, which was really the Thatcher period in the 1980s. That's when the architecture of independent regulation uh, was established uh, and had a very, very good run. 
Uh, I then describe the sort of New Labour or Blair period as one in which uh, a wider range of regulators were created. There were significant new powers awarded, not just to new regulators, but to uh, existing regulators as well. I think that was very significant, uh, particularly in terms of the breadth of scope. Uh, and then in the coalition period, uh, to, uh, I don't want to repeat what Ed has said, but I would also add uh, there was obviously the thrust of the bonfire of the quangos, which uh, I was a particular target of. Uh, there was some clipping of wings, uh, some repatriation of powers, some interesting mergers and new creations, uh, and also a much stronger emphasis on budget controls, uh, freedom of information and things of, of that kind. Now, what are the key issues that emerge through time uh, over this? Well, firstly, uh, I think the easy one is that it is important to remember things like budgets, size, transparency and things of that kind. And I think there was a period where some of that was slightly uh, lost touch with. But the, by far the bigger issue, as I think both Tom and Ed have said, is the question, uh, as you see it through time and indeed today, as it relates to what I would call legitimacy and authority. Now, uh, in the 1980s, I think that legitimacy of independent regulation was almost a fact by virtue of a regulator being independent. There actually was, for a period, an almost quasi-constitutional bipartisan settlement, a sort of post-Thatcher settlement, that independent regulators were good, uh, they were doing the right things because they were independent. And that was the result of the history of a bad period in this country in which politicians, I think, by wide acceptance, meddled too much with state enterprises, state infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And it did not produce good outcomes, and I think people were very broadly persuaded that the model of independent regulation was a better way of making decisions in those key areas. Uh, so, in a sense, we were in a situation where you were right purely because you were independent. You were legitimate purely because you were uh, independent. And I think that has changed quite significantly over the subsequent years. Uh, we've had perhaps the extreme example of that, which Tom has described in the rail track case. Uh, but one can think of a number of other examples. Uh, a recent one uh, where that relationship of understanding, I think, has changed. I mean, one is the case of NICE, where you have a very strong technical regulator uh, in that area, uh, and yet you have the government circumventing, uh, essentially, that regulatory approach through the creation of something like the Cancer Drugs Fund, which is essentially a political decision to create a specific fund which circumvents the regulatory structure. Uh, that's fine. That's just one of those things, and it's an, an observation. I think you can think about the financial services period in a similar way. So the tripartite regulatory model was deemed to have failed in the midst of the crisis. Uh, it was put under extraordinary pressure, obviously. Uh, but when one digs into that, and I've been in working in financial services for the last uh, many months, and when you talk to people around the place on this, you say, well, what was it really like? And what you discover is that there was a very clear set of political guidance which was described as light touch, but when you, when you scrape away at it, you discover that many people would describe it as heavy touch. So what was in fact happening was that there was a regulatory construct which was supposedly independent in many respects, but the political relationship with that regulatory uh, infrastructure was clearly changing, and there were very different views about the extent to which light touch was in fact heavy touch in terms of guidance. Let me give you another example from telecoms, which is my own world, which is mobile roaming. Uh, you'll all have enjoyed uh, mobile roaming, uh, the reductions to mobile roaming as you travel abroad, but uh, th this case sort of sticks in my mind because I was a very uh, heavily involved in the body of European regulators when mobile roaming was being discussed. Uh, and I remember one particular meeting where I turned up and there was a fantastic piece of econometrics that had been done. Uh, and the view articulated in the private meeting was that we'd done the cost analysis, the analysis was right, and the politicians were wrong. Uh, and I stood up in that meeting and I said, you might think that the cost analysis is right, uh, and I don't have the model to hand to verify that, 
but I can tell you that this is not going to work. Uh, and there were two or three of us out of 27, 28, who took that view. Uh, it was ignored by the majority. The consequence was that it became a crusade uh, in Europe from the Commissioner and the parliamentarians, and we all know what happened. Uh, the very careful econometrics that was correct was essentially thrown out uh, and mobile roaming was changed very radically. Perhaps one final example uh, of this trend, which I see uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a blend of uh, how this relationship has changed, and that is, that is the energy sector that uh, Ed talked about. I think it's, it's very, very interesting how these things look from different perspectives and different positions in life. Uh, and um, I wasn't involved in energy, but I was looking in, in on it from outside. And you know, what an independent regulator and another regulator saw in the case of energy was Ed Miliband's price freeze proposal. Uh, the uh, result of that was uh, essentially a frenzy of activity, as Ed has described. Uh, from an independent regulatory perspective, what you would observe is that essentially standard operating procedures were frozen uh, completely. Uh, to some degree or another, policy was then being made either by Number 10 or by the Treasury or by the Department, but it certainly didn't seem as if it was being made by Ofgem in any normal sense. Now, clearly, actually, Ed's account of it is very interesting because they were, it was clearly more complex than it looked from the outside. But all these examples are illustrations of my central uh, observation on this and how things, I think, have changed through time which is that that relationship and that understanding of what we mean between the relationship of uh, the political, the politicians, government and independent regulators has changed through time and it has become rather messy, rather uncertain and slightly unpredictable and that is a serious question. Now I don't think that is necessarily wrong. Uh, I think the question is what do we need to do to improve that? And I think the three, I'd make three observations about that. Um, the first is that I do think that in a number of cases, uh, some regulators have powers or a scope of their powers which may be too broad. I think there is a really serious question about whether the uh, success, the historic success of the independent regulatory model combined sometimes with politicians' desire to remove difficult questions from their own responsibility, uh, has uh, created a risk that sometimes regulators are making decisions and judgments in areas that actually are more properly made by politicians. So that's the first issue, I think. The second one, which is an echo really of what both Tom and Ed have said, I think there has been some loss of memory and understanding amongst contemporary politicians, some loss of recognition as to why independent regulation is a good and important thing in the first place. And that may be the passage of time, the loss of understanding of what preceded it, but I would observe that myself, I had to almost re-explain why sometimes it is a very good idea to remove some of these decisions from government and let them be done by a technically able, uh, non-politically driven re group of regulators. Uh, and I do worry about that and I, I think that is a, a serious question. Equally and thirdly, I think regulators, and this really is an echo of what Ed said, uh, I think there are and have been some regulators who have lost a sense of the source of their own legitimacy and authority. Uh, and I think occasionally they've become, or can become, slightly light-headed on the smell of their own technical prowess. Uh, sometimes these issues are very complicated, and sometimes these issues are not technically complicated. They're complicated because they involve value judgments, which do stray into the world of politics and judgment. And I think it's extremely important uh, for regulators to be very sensitive and aware of when that is and when that is not happening. And in my judgment, that has not always been the case. And 
to pick up those final, so on, on those three points, in my view, the problems arise, firstly, when regulators are doing jobs that they shouldn't really be doing, or when politicians have vacated ground that actually they should properly occupy. Secondly, when politicians have lost the plot about why it is good to exercise restraint and let independent regulators take independent decisions. And thirdly, when regulators themselves lose their intuition and their sense of uh, their own restraint about the place that an independent regulator has in a modern liberal democracy. So I do worry about that, and I do worry that there is a simmering um, subterranean uh, risk in relation to the confidence that we have in this system. And I don't think that's just a confidence about the UK, it's a confidence of international investors into the UK. I think it matters enormously, because if you, again, take a historical, historical perspective about this, what you notice is that the system of independent regulation is, is absolutely central to the modern state and economy. Uh, it is how we can make rational, objective decisions which create a predictable and stable environment, which is precisely the environment which is most likely to, to facilitate both investment and competition. So making sure that this institutional architecture and its legitimacy and its functioning is of the top quality, to me, is absolutely central to a successful modern economy. So I do worry about it, and I think the time is right to reappraise whether we are in the right place in a number of sectors and whether we've got the right understanding and culture between both politicians and regulators. Thank you. Uh, Ed, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> An enormous set of issues have, uh, 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 have been uh, brought forward, and I'm very conscious that there must be a lot of people wanting to ask questions. Can I ask that, uh, first of all, if you're going to ask a question, you need the microphone. Um, secondly, uh, can you say who you are and where you're from? Please remember all of this is being recorded. And also, could you keep questions as crisp as possible so we can get as many as possible uh, asked? I may try and group them together. If there's anybody next door who wants to ask a question, if they could come into the room, that would be helpful. Robert Hazel from the Constitution Unit at UCL and an associate of the IFG. Tom and the other speakers all stressed the importance of regulators being independent. Most of the uh, top regulators, before they're appointed, uh, have a pre-appointment scrutiny hearing with the Departmental Select Committee in their subject area. How effective do you think those parliamentary hearings are in trying to establish the independent mindedness of a regulator, or do you think they're really just window dressing? Uh. Yeah, so actually that's quite a novel, that's quite a recent development. Uh, it's, not, it's not been in, in place since you know, the start of independent regulation. Uh, I think that entirely depends upon the approach taken by the committee. Uh, I think if the committee treats the exercise mm -hmm. as an opportunity to uh, attack or showboat on the latest issue of the day in the papers, it's likely to be highly ineffective. Uh, if they treat it as a serious event in which the independence and authority and knowledge of the putative regulator uh, is the question, I think it could and should be extremely effective. I think it totally depends on the approach taken. My, my own, I did, I remember, I mean, trade, memories of comments by regulators. I, I, I had one very sharp exchange with another regulator once in which they uh, complained to me for about half an hour about having to do such a hearing. Uh, and I listened to this for quite some time. And in the end, I just said, look, I think you're completely wrong. Um, this is a really good thing. You should embrace it. It's part of your responsibility. Uh, and you need to go and do it properly. Uh, and you need to do it with some humility. 
Um, so I, I'm very pro these parliamentary uh, exercises. The, I'm very pro the parliamentary oversight, but it, it requires both parties to treat it in the way that, that best gets the best gets the best out of it. Um, just quickly, I think I was the second uh, uh, chair to be put through the process. It was the best part of two hours. It was uh, um, rigorous, absolutely fair. They kept the right side of any kind of a dividing line yeah. with a final report, which I thought added value. Yeah. So I would concur with your views. Can, can I just add? Yeah. Um, uh, I think that I could agree with everything that's said. It depends on the committee. Um, uh, but it's not just, of course, the uh, initial appointment. It's the ongoing accountability, I think, is very, very important. Yeah, and uh, you can obviously get and learn a lot more. And I think that's a very important part of the constitutional system. I would say that my main experience of, cro of, of, of crossing the Ambling Regulator was uh, when I was on the Treasury Select Committee, when the late, great uh, Sir Eddie George was the uh, Government Bank of England. And he was just so good, we could never, ever get him to say anything. And so uh, <laughs> the, 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 the pro the, but his problem was that he was addicted, addicted to cigarettes. Uh, and so we used to keep the hearings going on as long as possible. <laughs> so, so that by the end, he was so irritable, we sometimes thought he might drop the ball, but he never did. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, please. Can I just add? Yes, of course, very, Tom. Very I was anxious to get many questions no, as no, possible. Very, very, I, I, yeah. I, I agree with what Ed said. I, I, it really depends on the quality of the select committee and the, qu and, the qu and the quality of the questioning you get. In my experience, select, select committee, oh, I'm going to regret this, select committees are in too many respects not as sufficient, not sufficiently expert, particularly in the field of economic regulation. Mm, uh, and I think that the hearings are far too short mm. um, to be anything meaningful. Um, there was such anxiety, I went through one for the job I have now, mm. and there was such anxiety on the part of politicians that this was going to be all in wrestling and a bloodbath that the minister went on for 30 minutes before me just to, I don't know, draw their fire or something like that. But it was actually, it was a doddle. <laughs> We've got the microphone. And what I'd like to do is to take, um, Lauren, perhaps take two or three over in this side. There are certainly two, and then there's one a bit further back before anybody answers. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Duncan Buchanan from the Banking Standards Board, which is a non-regulatory a non-statutory, rather, approach to self-regulation, uh, which we haven't really touched on. But it's not actually that I wanted to pick up on. It was on um, your point, Ed, about piling in regulation, technical areas, into the likes of Ofcom, which has seen a vast expansion where you have new arenas like digital. And one that strikes me at the moment, which is a wrestling match, is over the BBC. And suggestions that Ofcom could take further responsibilities. Um, and where ministers are seemingly tempted to um, use the appointment system uh, and governance structures yeah. to blur the lines between regulation and independence in a slightly novel approach. This is uh, the debate over the BBC and a unitary board. And I wonder if anyone has a view on how ministers are using regula regulation and governance and their appointments powers uh, in this new mix? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. There's a lady behind. Uh, Fiona Gooch from Tradecraft. My question um, relates particularly to the resourcing of the Competition and Markets Authority, which in some cases is a bottleneck to perhaps expanding the powers of other regulators or updating the role of other regulators. But as I understand it, there's quite a, a constraint on resources, which potentially means that we don't have adequate um, updating of uh, regulators. I just wondered if people had any comments on that. That's also a good and helpful question. There, sorry, there's a lady here. Yes, thanks. Yes. I'm Christine Elliott, Independent. To what extent do you think that regulatory appointments, particularly where there has to be an element of a ministerial blessing um, to make the appointment, are compromised by revolving doors? So the BBC is a good example, even the Banking Standards Review Council, where people who were, the banks were comfortable with were appointed. Um, and then the new quasi-regulatory world that we have of police and crime commissioners where you have a political dimension, these all seem to be getting quite fudged. Does that help? Is that unhelpful? 
Yeah, I'm happy to go yeah. first. Um, so on the on ministerial appointment question, uh, perhaps two observations. But I, I liked the the Ofcom model. I have to say, uh, and that's not because you know it wasn't my idea. So whoever's idea it was, it was a good idea, which seems to me to s strike the right balance. And the Ofcom model was or is uh, that the Secretary of State of the day appoints the chair, chairman. And then the board appoints the chief executive. And the Secretary of State cannot sack the chief executive. Mm -hmm. And that always seemed to me, you know, in, a, in a world of imperfection, where there's no, there's no right answer to strike the best balance. And part of the chair, chairman's job in that context is always, and should be, and I was very lucky, I had you know, three, three chairs and they all did it brilliantly, uh, uh, to protect the chief executive from undue political interference. Mm. And I, I've always liked that, uh, and I, as I say, I had three great chairs who, who did that for me, and we discussed it. And it was very important for me to be free to make objective decisions without feeling that pressure. So I, I like that, and I know that's not always the case in other, in other areas. So I would, uh, I would uh, go for that. I mean, I, in thinking about this, I, I worked out that I had worked with, I think that's the right expression, um, about 12 different secretaries of state in my time, because I had a lot of rotation. Uh, <laughs> so multiple Labour, multiple Liberal Democrat, multiple Conservative, and indeed an SNP one, if you count uh, the Scottish Parliament. And I just wanted to add, because of what I said earlier, you know, actually, by and large, you know, my experience of that relationship, and this is the point I think both Tom and Ed mentioned about what's the relationship like, the tr you know, do you have trust or not, overwhelmingly my experience was very positive. I made an effort to make it work, but if you do make an effort, it does reduce the likelihood of that undue interference. That's the first thing. The, on the on the resources side, I don't know about CMA, so I, you know Ed's probably closer to it than me. The general point about resources, you know, I, I I take a view about this which is probably unpopular amongst um, regulators. I I think it is right and proper for regulators like everybody else to be subjected to quite stringent resource uh, questions from time to time. We reduced I reduced the cost of Ofcom by about thirty five percent while I was while I was there and you know it's still healthy uh, and in good shape I th I, I, you know yeah. it certainly is as far as everybody's aware um, regulators are like every other part of the public sector and like big companies you know they accrete cost and from time to time it needs to be challenged um, so I don't know about the specifics of the CMA but I do I do think there's two two sides to that argument that, that are important um, revolving doors, I do worry about revolving doors. Uh, I think um, there's a much bigger problem in some other countries revol with revolving doors, particularly the US. Um, I don't, it doesn't seem to me to be that bad here. My revolving door issue, I mean, I think that one of the safest things in terms of dealing with revolving doors is contract periods. I mean, I, I had a 12-month conflicts period, so I was not allowed to do anything at all in the sector, in, in the Ofcom area of uh, work for 12 months. That is very, that's a very long period. Um, but actually I was comfortable with that. I thought that was the right thing to do, both for my own integrity and reputation and for the organisation's integrity and reputation. So I think you need to think about those things as well. Any? You were lucky. I got two years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, shall I go a little yes, bit? Yes, certainly. I mean, um, uh, as a minister, I, I was surprised by how little uh, I was able to influence uh, appointment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that may just be because I was a Liberal Democrat in a coalition. Uh, um, my impression was cabinet office is critical to the whole uh, process, and uh, getting your hands of power in the cabinet office is, is really quite uh, mm. important. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm seeing a lot of signs that, uh, I mean, I, I know from talking to Nick and others that in the coalition we stopped quite a lot of, uh, of appointments that we thought were overtly political, mm. and I see that happening a lot now. And I think there's, if there's any journalists in the room, go and be, do a bit of investigatory journalism, please, because I think there's the equivalent of the Tony Cronies uh, going on at the moment. 
Um, uh, the, the, the one crony um, I appointed was a Tory, uh, actually, to the Climate Change Committee. I appointed okay. John Gummer, uh, and I was quite pleased to. I just mentioned regulatory appointments commission is an alternative to ministers making decisions mm. like the judicial appointments pr uh, commission because it puts a bit of buffer between, and, and, uh, and it's quite mm. overt, mm. between the ministerial decision and the, and the, uh, yeah. uh, the making of the appointment. Um, I, I'm really conscious of how many people want to ask questions. Lauren, the, Richard down here, is there, are there others along this side? Somebody at the back afterwards. I'll take three if I may, again. Um, thank you. Uh, Richard Thomas, I'm an ex-regulator, I was the Information Commissioner uh, at some time. I'm here today as a member of the Standards, uh, the Committee on Standards in Public Life, and we're currently carrying out a project on ethics for regulators, the ethical conduct of regulators, and the independence has very much emerged as one of the issues uh, we're, we're looking at. Um, I welcome any contribution from the panel. All of you talked about the need to get the right balance between those areas which are the proper domain of the regulator and those which are the proper domain of the politician. Mm -hmm. uh, could you attempt to articulate at least some of those areas, not comprehensively, but those areas which are respectively the proper domain of the politician and those of the regulator? And just while I've got the microphone, we've talked about uh, the appointments process. Um, our committee has expressed quite considerable fears about some of the proposals contained in the report published last week by Grimstone, um, Eddie, Grim Jerry. Jerry, Jerry Grimstone, the process for changing the uh, arrangements for all public appointments, including those of regulatory bodies, and we do have anxieties that's going to lead to considerably more direct ministerial involvement. Okay, so there are two questions at the back. Hi, uh, Shafiq Pandor, an economist from the Department for Transport. Um, my question is largely directed at Sir Tom. Um, so, do you think there are any redeeming kind of features of regulators choosing to work quite closely with government, or would your preference be that governments get treated kind of in a similar manner to other stakeholders? Yeah. And one more. Hi, Martin Hurst, independent, ex various bits of government. Um, We've heard quite a lot about kind of regulators good, politics bad. Uh, I think Ed was rather more nuanced in that asking about where the balance lies. Um, I think the question I've got, is there a connivance between politics and regulation to overlook the long term and whether the National Infrastructure Commission might be a third leg of the politics and regulation tripod? Right. Um, who would like to begin? I'll do it, if you wish. Yep, thank you. Um, the, um, the, I think the, the, the first and the third questions are very closely connected. What is the correct balance between um, politicians and regulators? Politicians overall should, should, you know, they're accountable to Parliament. Yeah, it's not a question of politicians bad. Politicians should just do the job that they are given by Parliament to do. My problem was the politicians didn't, they, sh they shirked it until it was too late, and then they rushed in in a violent and inappropriate way. Uh, so if they would just stick to what they do and leave the regulators to do what they do, then life would be a great deal better. And it is, uh, I don't believe there's any connivance of regulators and politicians to, um, to uh, sort of look at, uh, look at things in a too short term a way. I think regulators are very keen to do it in a long term way. And, and indeed, some politicians are too. Um, it is often said the most sec successful Secretary of State for Transport was Malcolm Rifkin, because no one can remember he was Secretary of State for Transport, <laughs> because he said that if you make the right decision, no one will know until 15 years later. If you make the wrong decision, people will know within 15 minutes. Um, but nevertheless, uh, long-term decisions really should, uh, the overall uh, policy context, yes. Uh, but not, not, not the individual decisions concerning investment uh, policy. Uh, th then there's the issue of money, and that's where the big clash that I had with the politicians was, yeah. because um, uh, I had the power to raise access charges, um, and uh, which, it, which is how much money the train operators paid to the network provider. Under a private law contract, between the Secretary of State and the train operators who had to pay 
these higher charges, there was a 100% pound for pound indemnity. That's where my jurisdiction to basically write large checks on the Treasury's checkbook came from because the government had to honour the contracts that they had made. It didn't actually, in that respect, come from my statutory remit. It came from a private law contract, and they did not want to honour that contract. So what they tried to do was basically neutralise the ability to raise the charges so they didn't have to honour the contract, because the only alternative was to break the contract. Well, that was awful. So that's that. Um, uh, but there are redeeming features of dealing with government. Yes, of course there are. Like I said in my remarks, good communication between the regulatory authority and the government is highly desirable. And I have to say that, whilst my independence in this present job has never come under pressure, the quality of communication and, frankly, trust that my organization has with the Home Office is in huge contrast to the hellish relationship we had with the Department of Transport 15 years ago. Um, I think it's quite difficult to set down a set of criteria which you can apply to every sector because um, I think yeah. sectors can differ yeah. so markedly um, and you know particularly when you move outside the economic sphere. But let me give, try to give you three brief examples where um, I think um, the political sphere comes in a bit more than the independent regulatory sphere. One is on distribution, um, you know, how are you going to ensure fairness? Now, the regulator can have some role in that, but, but ultimately, you know, using the tax and benefit system, using other policies, I think that's where you, uh, the political sphere uh, has, to, uh, has to really get grips with it. It's not to say that, you know, I talked to Ofgem about them thinking about fuel poverty, but ultimately that was my responsibility to tackle fuel poverty. But I just wanted them to be supportive, but the distribution element was, was, was mine. I think there's another area when markets and technologies are under dramatic transition. So the energy sector is under huge transition at the moment and will be for quite some time. And the vested interests, therefore, that are at, uh, at play, um, asking an independent regulator to, to manage that, I think, would be too difficult. I think there's fundamental political questions, political choices that have to be made about how we shape our energy system and politicians have to be account accountable for that, particularly when they're making such a bloody mess of it at the moment. Um, <laughs> th th thirdly, is um, uh, sometimes you're asking a regulator to get in amongst different companies. And I don't think a, 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 a government should be doing that, and it's much better for independent regulators to do that. And it's the example of the OGA, the Oil and Gas Authority, which no one ever notices, but maybe it's one of my Malcolm Rifkin decisions. <laughs> um, essentially, uh, we, DEC, have been regulating the North Sea or, uh, content, uh, UK content shelf since its inception. And you know, we, we'd done it okay, and people thought some of the officials there were fantastic, really brilliant officials, but we were under-resourced, and we were unwilling to do what we needed to do in a mature basin, which is to actually coordinate private sector activity because uh, the decisions of one private sector operator can completely undermine the investment of another. Uh, I won't go into the boring details of it, but we need a dramatic coordination. I think a government department and civil servants and minister just can't do that because you're having to choose between commercial interests. So I think an independent regulator there makes much, much greater sense and that's, what we, that's why we, one of the reasons why we created the OGA. So, if I have to say a couple of words on this, um, very quickly. Yeah, so, just because so I'm so conscious okay, of so asking so questions. So, yeah. so look, I, I thought about this balance between regulatory, what's regulatory remit and political remit quite a lot. And as Ed says, there's no right answer. You have to think about the sort of principles associated with each one. And the principles which generally make a decision appropriate for regulatory is that the decision is technical, empirical, uh, lends itself to objective analysis and which tip and typically is characterized by having uh, fewer trade-offs or fewer fewer objectives uh, so not quite one one objective but but fewer the, the realm of politics is obviously more about where you are making judgments where you are making choices where values are are, um, are, are at the heart of it uh, and where there are multiple uh, competing objectives which need to be which need to be balanced and typically you know it's a messy area but that, that, that's roughly where I, where I would be uh, should government be treated exactly the same as another stakeholder no nope. not in my view I think that's unrealistic uh, 
Uh, and as Tom said earlier, you know, if you make a decision with significant public consequences and you don't even advise the department that it's coming out, uh, then you know, that just seems to me to be a really perverse and foolhardy <coughs> form of behaviour. Um, uh, there are very occasionally cases where of extreme market sensitivity where you have to be careful, but even then, departments deal with market sensitive information all the, t all the time and can and should be trusted in such circumstances. Um, long run connivance, sorry, and very quickly on the long run connivance. This is a very interesting question. And to argue slightly against myself earlier, I think one of the critical tasks of an independent <coughs> regulator is to be the bulwark against short termism. Uh, it is inevitable and unholy understandable that politicians are going to be subject to some degree to the terror of the daily newspapers. The whole point of being an independent regulator is that you should not be driven by today's or tomorrow's press coverage. So that is one of the tensions and I think that is one of the responsibilities that anyone becoming uh, an independent regulator needs to bear right at the forefront of their mind. I'd like to take, I, th I think I'm going to only have time for three more questions and the answers to them. Uh, there seemed to be a nest at the back there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Stephen Tyndale from Weinberg Next Nuclear, a pro-nuclear charity, so I have heard of the Office for Nuclear Regulation. <laughs> and I, I agree with that, David, that it's a good institution with good people, although not enough people in my view. My question is actually about Ofgem, which does have enough people, uh, and it has had its, some of them quite good, uh, it has had its wings clipped by being told it should not speak out publicly on government policy. So Ed, in the purely hypothetical situation where Ofgem was not in full agreement with some of the things that the elected government was doing, should it speak out publicly or should it just say, we're not elected, we'll do as we're told? Next. John Smith, independent economic consultant. Um, Ed referred to the history of, of privatization. And I think the background is important because there have been underinvestment in these nationalized industries. And the privatization was about attracting private capital. And that has been most successful in something like the water industry, where there have been decades of underinvestment. Since privatization 25 years ago, there has been something like 40 billion in investment by the industry, um, and there has been confidence in the regulatory regime. That's provided stability um, and encouraged investors. In rail, and I have experience because I worked uh, in the rail industry at the same time uh, as Tom was regulator, privatization did not succeed in attracting private capital for major enhancement schemes for a whole range of reasons, mm -hmm. although there was the appetite I think in the late 90s to do that. And today we have a situation where the rail infrastructure provider has been reclassified as a publicly owned body. We've got a regulatory, quasi-regulatory regime extended to the provider of the strategic highway network, Highways England, and the investment decisions are being made by government. And that raises all sorts of issues about the role of independent regulation for publicly owned utilities. Um, and I think one does draw the contrast between where you're trying to get private capital to invest in these utilities and other areas where government really has, has decided it's going to make the investment decisions and provide the um, investment finance. Thank you. Uh, is there one more question? If not, um, mm. yep. <coughs> Uh, Paul Durham from the Care Quality Commission. I just wonder how we could get better at telling um, the or telling the story about the advantages of independent regulation. How do we get that sort of story out better? Thank you. Admirably brief. Um, any response from yeah, the three um, of you? Well, I wasn't actually aware. Um, maybe <laughs> I just hadn't followed the, the machinations of my successor um, that they've been forbidden to speak out publicly. <laughs> Uh, I certainly would have made that ruling. Um, clearly it's uncomfortable if they are in, d in direct contradiction of what the government of the day is saying, and there's, there's the standoff. And um, I think most regulators uh, choose their words carefully for the sort of reasons that, that Ed Richard, uh, Richard said. Um, uh, 
I mean, uh, I think Dermot Nolan, one of the things I think he's been, why he's been so good as a chief executive is he's actually been able to go out in a way that maybe some of his predecessors didn't and publicly explain himself, explain the decisions and try and get on the front foot. And I think given the sensitivity around the energy debate, that was, that's uh, been a real step forward in trying to explain, explain some of the, the, the issues. So um, I think it's an advantage of having someone like Dermot out there and I don't think he should be uh, uh, leashed in any way. Um, if I may briefly on the others, I'm going to say something about the rail industry, which I don't know very little except uh, as a commuter. Um, and uh, this may be, you, Tom may think I'm completely bonkers. But I, I thought the, the, the problem of regulating it was created right at the beginning w when there wasn't vertical integration. It seemed to me that, um, you know, when I've looked at the challenges of South, South West Trains, which is the company that used to serve my constituency, uh, and how it, I mean, it's eventually tried to get around it. But I think if you're not responsible for the whole network in your area in the way that you are in water, I think it creates uh, so, some extra challenges and extra costs. So I may be completely wrong, but I'd have thought vertical integration m might help. In terms of telling the story better for independent regulators, um, I, I think it's, a, it's a, actually it's a job for all of us to do. That's why the, today is really important. Um, uh, it's, it's not exactly going to be the story that gets the front pages uh, going, ever. That's the reality. But I think there needs to be, whether it's through the Institute of Government or elsewhere, uh, a recognition and a reminder, as Ed was saying, uh, that, that of its important role and how it works constitutionally. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I very much agree with that last comment. Uh, I, you know, there's no, there's no easy answer to it. I mean, you need to have a drumbeat of discussion about it so people are thinking about it and making good judgments about it because uh, you know, that's the only way to, to, to address it, I think. Um, I, I don't know what's happened uh, on the off-gem uh, situation either, Stephen. I mean, I would, you know, I would say it depends what you mean. I mean, if, if the notion that a regulator should stand up and, as it were, comment or criticise government policy that has gone through Parliament, you know, I do find quite uncomfortable. Um, does that mean that I think a regulator should be, uh, um, you know, uh, Unable to speak out and uh, on key issues, of course, of course not. Um, I think it's absolutely critical, uh, and this job of explanation is is profoundly important. Uh, if you don't explain your decisions, again, you're you're you are um, you're misunderstanding the nature of your role, which is very important given the breadth and impact of those decisions in the modern economy. So it's, it's essential that regulators are transparent and explain their decisions <coughs> in the right way. So definitely not muzzled, but you know, you've got to exercise caution on commenting on government policy if government policy has been properly agreed by Parliament. Um, now, the one, the, so the one other final comment for me uh, is this issue of investment. So uh, you know, the, this is very important. I, I, I'm, I'm also, uh, um, if I'll now be no doubt, um, uh, Attacked afterwards, but I'm, I also <laughs> been on the. I've sat on a board of Thames Water in a different sector for the last few because I wanted to see these issues from the perspective of a company. Um, so I think this investment issue is is very important. There is no doubt in my mind that in the right areas, a stable, predictable environment uh, run in a healthy, well-functioning way between government on the one hand and independent regulator on the other hand generally speaking, will produce more investment at lower cost. Now, there, is going to be, there are going to be differences about that sector by sector. Sometimes uh, the state is more directly involved for a whole specific set of reasons. But generally speaking, if you get this right, you're, you're in a better place than if you, if you get it wrong economically. Uh, I think that's, that's very clear and you know, talking to investors, global investors about how they perceive the UK as opposed to other jurisdictions in which they can invest, you, you hear that re repeatedly. So it's a, it's a, that is a very big issue and probably not discussed as much in political circles as it probably should be. Tom, you've got brief. very brief because I'm conscious of time and yes, therefore wrapping it up. Yeah. First point, um, should regulators uh, criticise government policy? Uh, probably not, um, except insofar as um, things get terribly hot and, and, and politicians are crossing the line. 
uh, I have always taken the view as the regulator and the inspectorate that it is our obligation, at least implied obligation, to promote the policy and purposes of the statute because the statute is the highest uh, expression of democratic legitimacy established by Parliament. And that is not the same as bending the knee to ministers. On railway investment, that's for another day. But um, <laughs> I think that there wasn't uh, pri significant private sector capital in the railway, except for the rolling stock leasing companies that put lots of money in, uh, beca principally because of the strategic rail authority, and I hesitate to say it, John, rail track, who were utterly hostile to uh, um, almost everyone um, who wanted to do something on the railway. Um, and um, as far as um, promoting the story of uh, independent economic regulation, I would recommend that um, you have a look at the websites of the World Bank and the OECD, who have, uh, particularly the OECD, they have some, uh, some materials there on um, the whole dynamics of regulation, independence, what regulators do, what they shouldn't do, how they should do it, regulatory legitimacy and so on. It is a, a, an Aladdin's cave of material of very high quality. Thank you. Um, it, f first of all, actually, I'd like to thank the three of you because I think what you've done is to lay out a series of extremely important issues and you've done it in a very thought-provoking way and actually regulation can be very dry and it has not been with the three of you and that's been hugely uh, positive to get these uh, areas discussed. I would also actually like to thank the Institute for Government for putting on this series and particularly today because I think it has surfaced some very important issues and I hope the Institute for Government will actually take some of those issues further because I think there's been a message about the real value of independent regulation but some important issues about what's the right balance between uh, regulators and politicians. There are some things that regulators can do very well, there are some things which politicians need to do and there are some spaces which can cause tension between <laughs> regulation and politicians which need to be thought about further. I have to say, I personally, uh, with uh, uh, the breadth of regulatory experience I have, what resonated particularly with me was the importance of building up the right relationship with the gov relevant government department. Uh, I absolutely agree with you, Tom. You can sometimes do that because both parties have to tango, yeah. but I think that allows some of the, the flashpoints to be discussed earlier, and then hopefully one can get a system which actually provides what we all want, which is the right kind of long-term investment into these essential sectors which benefit the UK as a whole. So, Institute of Government, thank you for, uh, for uh, ensuring that these issues were discussed more fully. Thank you all.